what has been some of the most radical improvements uh, uh, that you have noticed uh, from doing so, so many tests, how people were able to turn it around? Um, it really depends on the person. And, you know, it's not patient, uh, patient data is private and our users own their data. We publish trials. Um, so we have lots of trials on, 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 on different. So, for example, estrogen would have a really high impact uh, on your glycan age. But this is women who've lost estrogen because of menopause and you're giving them back estrogen. It can also be men. So men who've lost testosterone, if you give them back testosterone, we see positive effect, but not because of the testosterone. So testosterone level doesn't matter. It's the estrogen level because in men, testosterone converts to estrogen. And there's a healthy range, shouldn't be too low, shouldn't be too high. And that seems to keep their immune system anti-inflammatory and is very important uh, for long-term health outcomes. And there's even data now that um, men who go on raw estrogen, uh, uh, people who transition, um, <laughs> who, who go through gender affirming therapy to tra yeah. transition into uh, women trans female, they uh, look more anti-inflammatory and they have less coronary uh, plaque, so less cardiovascular disease. Um, so, but you can get this for testosterone. You don't need to go on raw, raw estrogen. <laughs> um, and this is only a factor if it's low for you, which it wouldn't be for a young man unless there's a problem. And in that case, you first want to remove the problem uh, and then wait until you uh, are in your later years and replace it when you actually need it. Um, so that's one related to therapy. Now, on another side, if you're looking at an individual, you have to figure out what is his problem. Because it doesn't matter what we say is general advice. It has to apply to you. And we see that the biggest drivers, for example, athletes, are generally more prone flame. Uh, so before we started, you told me you do a lot of sports. Uh, on a competitive level. We're slowly getting there. <laughs> yeah. um, so we did a big, we did a number of studies on, on sports and one um, com larger review, uh, paper, um, larger study where we compared different types of sports and different profiles of training from moderate to just beginning to exercise or go to the gym between 40s and 60s to professional athletes. And when we compare professional athletes and people who are sedentary and they've never trained in their life and they're a little bit overweight, um, professional athletes are equally inflamed as the sedentary overweight people, um, which is also a risk factor. This is why professional athletes have very short careers because they do damage to their bodies very early on. Um, now, moderate training looks the youngest. So people who moderately train throughout their life, they have the lowest inflammatory scores. And then if you compare professional athletes, male and female, women look the worst. Uh, and they also would frequently lose their cycles. Uh, depending on the sport, they can lose bone density. And there's a number of factors there that would mimic aging in a young woman because of the load of sports uh, or physical stress she's putting on her body. Uh, so when you're an athlete, you're not really working for longevity. You're working for performance. And performance and longevity are actually two opposite things. Because for performance, you need the same as entrepreneurship. You need to sacrifice yourself for a couple of years for an impact. And then you will fix the damage later on. And that's what you need to do with sports as well. So with athletes, we don't look at, we would see how inflamed they are when they compete. But what we really want to measure is how well do they recover after competing. And if you follow, a, we did bodybuilding as, as sport that you follow before competing and after, uh, also marathon runners, um, they would start with a relatively good baseline, so not so inflamed, closer to their age. As they compete, they would accelerate. It can be a decade, it can, be, it can go quite high. Um, and then three months later, they recover. Sometimes they go back to their baseline. Sometimes their baseline is a little bit more inflammatory. And then what they started, uh, what they started at. Um, so it depends where you are in your competing recovery uh, training journey. Uh, that needs to be interpreted uh, for an individual. And then the main thing you would want to care about uh, as an athlete or somebody who does sports uh, is how well you recover after competing. 
so a couple of months. Do athletes ever go below the baseline that uh, you would see that uh, they are actually uh, their biological age uh, is way lower than what is their chronological age? Oh, of course they do, but they're usually an anomaly, not not the average. So when we find an athlete who's very, very anti-inflammatory, we want to explore what he's doing. So like, what do you do? Because uh, if you're looking at like a professional soccer player, rugby player, yeah. any, they are usually highly inflamed. So the the damage has been done pretty much because they just have to train mm-hmm. so much, I guess. Well, you are at recovery period. They still recover. So when it's off season. Uh, and then if we look at retired athlete, uh, athletes, they usually do still have a higher inflammatory load um, on average, but some of them don't. So I think it's all this new science we're learning with sports on recovery and how important recovery is because you are doing damage. And if you want to have a long term career as an athlete, you want to train uh, past your 40s, uh, then you need to look after your body uh, a lot more. So yes, you can have a great score as an athlete, and if if you do, you need to tell us what you're doing. <laughs> and then you, can... you must, uh, yeah. If if you have a great score, you must be doing something right for sure. Um, uh, have you done any comparison? Because I know that there is uh, there are plenty of products in the market that uh, claim to tell you your biological age. Have you actually done any comparison with uh, any of those or uh, any ones that you have experience with personally? Um, yes, we have. So we, you have, um, well, many different ways of measuring aging. So you can do it through proteomics, uh, epigenetics, uh, glycomics. Uh, we do the glycomics side. And it's kind of like comparing apples and oranges. They shouldn't be compared. Um, so usually... And and when we correlate them in studies, uh, they don't compare, especially epigenetics and glycomics. They can be on a completely different uh, scale. You can be you can have a younger epigenetic age and a higher uh, inflammation age or, or glycan age. Um, if we compare to outcomes, so how well do we predict uh, future hospitalization? Uh, glycomics was the best performer. So what we measure was the best at predicting uh, hospital- hospitalization in 10 years time. Uh, also, when we compare the specific mortality predictor, predictors, so this is grim age, it's not commercially available because nobody wants to buy their own mortality predictor. <laughs> um, but when we compare that to glycomics, uh, we were equally good at predicting uh, all cause mortality in the future. So it, it, the lesson here is that aging is a very complex system. And there are many... We, these are still theories of aging. So with epigenetic, the theory of aging is that we have a program. And then if we reprogram that program, we might be able to double our lifespan. Uh, that's the whole idea behind the re- reprogramming therapies, which would be great. But one reason why that probably won't come out as we're expecting is that it's just one of the problems. Like if you eliminated inflammation, you had the best um glycan clock you have doesn't mean that there's not other factors there which are going to make you age this will you'll just be at less risk of disease and mortality because your inflammation is is that of a young person um so there is one interesting study done by steve horvath which is the, a german scientist who invented the epigenetic clocks where he was comparing a bunch of different epigenetic clocks and um with epigenetics it's kind of looking at past environment with a bunch of different information and then modeling a clock on mortality, on disease prediction, on age prediction. And by age, I mean your chronological age, which is what most of these clocks are. So they're very good at predicting your passport age, which doesn't mean that they'll be good at predicting a health outcome. And then he had another clock that was invented, which predicts maximum lifespan, both in humans, but also in all the animal models. And then he was comparing these clocks. So how does the clock that predicts disease and that predicts mortality, how does that compare to the clock that predicts maximum lifespan? And none of these clocks compared. <laughs> so what that means is that we probably do have a program which gives us our maximum lifespan as a human species, same as this does in every animal model. But what kills us along the way is different to this program that gives us a maximum lifespan. 